Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's take a sip. Okay. You know, there was like an interview with Morrissey one time, and they said, like, do you ever do any kind of like vocal training or any kind of pre pro before you go on to perform ever? He's like, no. He's like, I just sit there and read a magazine so they come out and tell me <laughs> that it's time to go on. And I'm like, yeah, I can actually really, really relate with that. I'm just pretty much sitting in a waiting room, just like reading and they're like, all right, it's good to go. Welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm going to ask a question. This can be a little bit self-indulgent, but it's been a little while. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, Cyprian and Father Turbo, if you guys could write for uh, Marvel or DC, which one would it be? What character mm -hmm. and do you have a story that you would want to tell? Because I have, mm. I have an answer if you guys need just a sec. I'm, I'll just go and go first. So. Go ahead and go, an go ahead and do. All right, oh, Father. Okay, Father. Go, go ahead. ahead. I've already done it. So, uh, DC. I have a Batman story I've sat on for twenty five years. Oh, mm. all right. Uh, and it's basically the story of Bruce Wayne, well, Batman, encountering something so beyond his comprehension you know kind of he's always able to rationalize etrigan you know mm -hmm. and morgan mm -hmm. lefane all that stuff but he encounters you know um something that brings him to this real place of existential crisis and faith um and he realizes that he needs to go above and beyond to battle this basically demonic mm -hmm. force mm -hmm. and so he begins to explore his wayne roots he begins to go deep and he ends up finding out that, you know, he has this kind of like this like um, Huguenot lineage and all that stuff, you know, mm. um, and he eventually begins to take on these um, kind of tools and approaches of basically like an exorcist. And so mm. then mm. he begins to now incorporate, you know, this kind of deep, you know, very Catholic, whatever, but faith. Um, and then he begins to really pull apart this kind of case. But subsequently from there, it put him on this whole trajectory. And then I had this whole like design where his like suit began to become um, kind of like, it was a little bit of a spawn pull, but kind of infusing some supernatural elements, you know? So that was a story I would tell. I like it. Are there are there in Marvel there are outright demons like interacting with the character? Is are there? I can't seem to recall. Are they are there outright demons in the DC sort of universe? I, you actually can't. You have it a little bit switched. Okay. Marvel really? Marvel has a has a devil. But is that, his name's actually Mephisto? And yeah, Mephisto. Was, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, but it's outside of a Judeo-Christian context. He's kind of just like the king of another dimension. It's like the same thing. With... Right. I guess they're dimensional. They're they're demons, but they're like not real. They're dimension. They're not in a. Yeah, that's what that's. Yeah, I guess. Like that's Asgardians what I, what aren't actually gods. They're just seen as right. gods because right, right, they're, right. they're so far. Father, if this were a run of issues, how many issues do you think that would be? Like how many issues? It'd be like, 12, like, it'd be like a twelve issue run. Be like a like a solid just twelve issue run. It'd be like a mm -hmm. maxi series. That's legit. Yeah. Hey, I'd read it. It's and Father, since you know, and I'm Cyprian, I'm not. You don't have to answer this because who would you want? Yeah, to I don't. Be your, I, who would I you want know. to be your artist? Oh, um, I was really inspired by a guy people have probably heard of. Uh, his name is Norm Brayfogle. He did this really crazy run on Batman. It was really good. Um, I'd like he is great, but I mean. Obviously, you're not going to beat Magnola. Uh, Magnola would be the perfect guy to do 
Magnolia. I was talking about. Yeah, because um, you could actually probably see a lot of that already shining through, and like, um, or not shining through. You could definitely see how that would be an easy transition for him. Have you ever seen him draw? Uh, Batman? Gas Gotham by Gaslight. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Gotham by Gaslight. And I think he did um, the Doom that came to Gotham, mm -hmm. uh, which either he wrote that or he drew it. I can't remember, but that's another one. That's yeah. Anyway, anyway, Cyprian, what about you? I I have I honestly have no no idea. It, it would be Marvel for sure, but I don't yeah. know. Just because I'm just way more familiar with that universe. From I, I don't think when I was coming up, I read really any DC stuff. Sure. I really can't recall that I did. So it would definitely be Marvel. But yeah, I can't. I can't. Th what I do know is that like I, I would not. I definitely wouldn't want to do anything that was a like team. I wouldn't write want to write anything that was a team. Mm -hmm. I would I would want to write a so solo for sure. But I don't know who. I don't know who. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i don't have much to add to that because um i was looking at norm bray fogel because i was looking at the artist i thought it was but i actually think you could write a heck of a magneto story just saying i think that like you could actually probably write like a, uh i don't know you he's know, one of I'm, my favorites he's one of my favorites for sure and maybe that's why i'm, I'm bringing him up i think you've talked about how like you mm -hmm. think he's a really interesting villain but yeah, I think I, would, I think he's probably the best character in all of Marvel, in my opinion. Yeah. I think if you were to write a DC character, I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but if you were to, I think you do a good job, Green Lantern. Like, I think you can get like a major I like Green Lantern Green. too. I, yeah. I actually I <laughs> he's I, he's probably my favorite DC character. Yeah. But I but I don't think but I think the freedom with the Green Lantern whole entire thing and arc is that if I was gonna do it, I think I would want to bring in a brand new lantern. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know like because that's the freedom mm -hmm. you have that when you're dealing when you're doing green lantern mm -hmm. you have the freedom to just fully just bring in a brand new lantern and deal with mm -hmm. them you know what yeah. i mean and that's probably what i would end up doing yeah so um well hey again i'd read it but um i think it, for me i would write the um well i'd write captain america uh right which i think that they've actually already started doing this i haven't read it but i would do like a dark knight returns but for captain america or hmm. he's old and grizzled, but he, you know, just can't stand seeing what he's seeing in society anymore. And he absolutely has to do something about it. And I think it'd be interesting because the whole Dark Knight returns the crux of that story. Well, not the crux of the story, but one of the aspects that's really explored is the fact that, um, I mean, it's the obsession for Bruce to become Batman is so um, described as something clawing inside of him. Which I would suppose it denotes some kind of evil, some kind of like uh like some kind of ruthless obsession, not necessarily, maybe, but it's not coming from a good place. It's coming from an obsessive dark place. So what happens if you took that obsession and turned it into, well, this is coming from a place of good. This is like coming from a a heart that is not damaged like Bruce's, but comes from a place of like gold, of like goodness, of like I need to come back. Because the things I'm seeing are so overt and so bad, I have to do something. If I don't do something about it, then I'm going to go crazy. And so, you know, you could start with like a slightly tubby Steve Rogers. Maybe he's found a type of alcohol that his body can, you know, whatever. Because, you know, the super soldier serum tends to take care of it. And does he age? That's like, how could you have an old grizzled Captain America? Does, he I wasn't aware that he could slowly. age. He okay, ages okay. more slowly. So this is far in the future? I would have to think so because, I mean, it yeah. had to be far enough where most of his contemporaries are dead. They got to be all dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Um, yeah. Or you get twisted versions or sons or daughters or whatever, whatever. It's but, got almost a Watchmen thing to it, no? Uh, well, I mean, I can I can see that because it's like uh, it touches on the intergeneration, like the legacy mm -hmm. of the character, which mm -hmm. is Watchmen definitely touches on because then you'd have to have either descendants or weird mm -hmm. Mac where Tony Stark is like just a living brain inside like an Iron Man body or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and then, you know, like throwing like a Carrie Kelly esque Robin or Bucky, but maybe like um like a little like a like a starry eyed young Bucky with cap so that, you know, she could kind of like experience mm. 
what that would be like, like the world, the gritty world of, you know, I think they're kind of doing that now in Marvel with a series called Avengers Twilight. I haven't read it yet. I want to understand it's one of these amazing series is, but I don't, I don't really want to w- read it quite yet. So, um, but yeah, I think that would be, and then like, of course, at the end of everything, you find out it's the Red Skull. Like the Red Skull is the one pulling the strings and Cap has to go either fight him. Either that would be in the second act, like in Dark Knight Returns, where you confront the ultimate enemy and then move on. And then there's a third act, or that would be the third act. I think probably more of the second act, but I don't know. It's never going to get written. I'm never going to do it, but that's what I would do. And then probably, uh, I would want to say the artist, and this is for the like five people in the audience and for Father Turbo, but Stuart Eminen would want to be the artist that I would want to have, or, um, uh, there's this other guy I think could work, but I think it'd be maybe a little bit obnoxious is Sean Murphy. Um, he did, I mean, he's done some stuff, but anyway, he's kind of obnoxious. Like his style might be a little bit too much. It's real sketchy, real angular, but, uh, he does a great job with stuff like that. So anyway, thank you. That was 15 good minutes. And so everyone who doesn't care about comic books, you can start listening now. So, Yeah. <laughs> Um, stamps <laughs> yeah for real for real um so i don't have anything to talk about but i'm sure you guys what's going on with uh what's happening with you i so i have something that i've noticed uh the last it occurred to me this morning as i was watching some stuff about the about the thing and the thing that happened in baltimore with the that giant ship hitting the bridge right and but it was also, you know, obviously with the thing that happened in Russia and my wife is Russian, right? So sort of getting like, well, what's the mood of things that are going on? And something uh, like something occurred to me this this morning as I was like watching just, you know, you know random little news things or whatever about the th- things going on is that. And it occurred to me that we've moved, I think, even in the mainstream something has happened to where the default is now the conspiracy theory it's almost like no i'm not sure that that anyone it's like the the default seems to be more people are are inclined that the idea of principalities and powers, even if they don't understand it, it almost seems like it's. I know that at one time that was obviously the mainstream. Like all you have to do is read like the Iliad. You know what I mean? Like there was a time in human history when it was the mainstream that like absolutely everything that's happening is principalities and powers, and we just take that for granted. But for the first time in my life, and I don't know whether this is just like confirmation bias, but it seems like everything that I'm seeing at every level and people that I'm talking to who are not religious in any way, it seems like the something has happened where a flip has occurred where the default is now there's something bigger, something higher, something spiritual for good or bad, and none of the mechanistic scientific you know, explanations, although they're being put out there, it's almost like they're immediately just, nope, gone at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've, I've been finding this really interesting because it's weird in terms of like, well, what are the, even for those of us who it's like, yeah, this is, and especially over the last several years, you know, and even in doing this project, I can say that at the beginning of even doing this project, we would talk about these concepts. And I think the underlying presupposition for us was that this was like the minority view. Mm -hmm. That was like the underlying presupposition of the, of our understanding of reality. And I think now the question becomes like, what do those of us who accept that this is the nature of reality, what do we do when now it is the, mainstream presupposition but the orientation toward christ is lacking in the mainstream isn't this the whole thing that father's been warning us about that's what i want to talk about i feel like we're here i feel like these Mm -hmm. big events are happening 
and people because i think i think my my inclination look i mean andrew how old were you during when 9 11 have we talked about this yeah we yeah uh i think i was in seventh grade so I was okay over 13 relatively young relatively young and and you know and somebody mentioned this today when they were talking about like they specifically mentioned 9-11 and the fact that like after that happened they were like yeah we found their passports in the like yeah. rubble and yeah. stuff but the mainstream individual was willing to accept that and believe it you know what i mean it was you were yeah. a kook were you to question yeah. it so father i can tell you've got something i just want to ask really quick cyprian yes seem like your dude who's got his stuff together you're good at collecting data i'm not meaning yes. to question your methods that is yes, not go ahead. what i've encountered oh that's why encountered i wanted to talk that. about it so maybe because maybe the algorithm is like well these are the things that you're going to want to be checking on like this is your viewpoint well no i'm 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 referencing this relative to to a set of conversations that i've recently had even in person okay with people who have come onto the island, even in the past week, that's why it really occurred to me, who are like as mainstream as it gets. Like editors of, if I said the name of the, I don't want to bust her out, like editors money. of magazines that are like on every like counter who run around with people who are even, would be considered the highest level of wokes, very influential, like household names. And even from her, and the people she is traveling with, it was like a given. Things would come up and it was a given that it's like, no, it's not whatever the mainstream's saying to you. Yeah. And they're mainstream media. Yeah. I mean, wasn't that something that we saw so shockingly with Naomi Wolf? This, okay, there's another ex great example, right? There's another great example right there. <laughs> right, and um, yeah, I, it's funny because um, like I was saying, like the, the conversation I, conversation I just had was centered around some of this. Um, and I think it's where, um, I think it's where some nationalism some of these things kind of like rise up, but mm. ultimately, I mean, is it, isn't it, isn't it a priming? Um, because, mm. right. I mean, like I wanted to ask you actually about the dim age. And about this is it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is you it. Know, about the teenage and 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 um and really kind of bringing some of that into the conversation because one of the problems I think is um, what happens if things keep getting drawn out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you know, as as things are getting drawn out, um there's another side to what you're talking about, which is um, for as much as like in the churches, like the church's state side are seeing huge explosions, parishes mm -hmm. everywhere. But what's not being talked about is there's just as much, if not more people who are just kind of like abandoning Christianity. Like for, mm -hmm. for so for Orthodoxy as much as we, or just Christianity in general, excuse me, Father. Christianity in general, Okay. But that very quickly can bleed into, and I mean this not charitably, but just kind of being as objective as I can, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, man, I know someone's going to tear me up on this one, but well, like, generally speaking, anyone who's going to kind of be in our audience are swimming in particular pools, mm -hmm. right? even if they're not orthodox, they're swimming in particular pools, right? And I think the thing people need to understand is the church is a lot broader than the people who would kind of be swimming in the pools that we're swimming in. So in other words, it could be, first of all, it could be misleading because the reality is, is you talk to your average person in your average GOA parish, they're not gonna be hearing about the, the intersection of political analysis um you know supernatural phenomena you know what i mean they're they're not they're still voting for biden and you know what i'm saying like they're still on that level and this is really pertinent to this conversation because um 
a good swath of the people who are quote unquote in the church are still those mainstream normie people who are just forgive me, you know, they're just they're orthodox because they're whatever fill in the blank ethnicity, right? Um, and they just do what they do, right? They pay the bills, they go do the whatever. And they very much bleed into that kind of broader milieu of quote unquote Christians, right? These are the same people who would be like, yeah, it's all the same. Like, I think everyone in there kind of understands what I'm saying. Yeah. Though that swath of people numerically are much larger than the people who are quote unquote informed, right? So you take us who were small fries in regards of like numbers, right? Subscribers. Let's just say if we're measured by subscribers, right? But if you take us and you take Jay and you take, you know, even Father Peter, you that's still small. If you if you put together those numbers, that's still small in comparison to the, the demographic I'm talking about. Are you following me? Yeah. Right? All of those people are being primed. All of those people are being primed. And this is going to sound crazy, but when you see like what's going on with with uh, with Kanye and the kind of putting out of like his flipping back and forth and the playing with the darkness and all that, it's like that public display of moving in and out of faith, not believing, right? And and just this dialogue of like Christ is King with like Candace kind of Owens, all this stuff. I think what people are missing is that it's it's beginning to really um, play out this loaded narrative in the sense that it's gonna get people missing what we've been talking about, which is that kind of personal transformation, first and foremost, that personal transformation is what lines you up with the fathers, lines you up with the heart of the church. Are you, are you following me? And without that, without that more, without those moorings, then it's a lot easier to just not discern these things because when people are like, yeah, 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 you know, of course the media is fake and this and that, you're now, what's the old saying? If you're the one who, um, was it the one who stands for nothing is open for everything? Is that how? Yeah, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And to summarize what I've been trying to say, that will become the kind of de facto reality for a lot of people because of that. Because remember, that's part of the problem with the conspiracy theory um, tonality is the sense of, yeah, I know. Or you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm not a dupe. Right. Sure. All the while you're voting for Biden, all the while you're voting for, you know, whoever, <laughs> you know what I mean? But you don't want to look like the dupe. And it just it it, it gets more and more of the, the numbing. It's, it's the opposite of honing. It's the opposite of being able uh, to discern and to say, I don't know about that. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's a un, it's the yeah, I think that idea of unmooring to where it would almost be better like if you're not oriented toward Christ, and I think this goes to the whole like dim age idea, like the danger is that if you're not oriented toward Christ, it's almost like you would be better off being like a new atheist, hardcore materialist than you would be go moving into mysticism. Let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. Because at least you would be more, it might be wrong and it might be like, inadequate to truly describe reality and maybe you're taking the part as a whole and maybe it's idolatry but it's not just absolute demonic chaos of like just falling into the abyss mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you you won't yeah. necessarily be saved but you're not necessarily headlong driving yourself to perdition if that's like I makes any sense yeah i mean i think the way that i would take take the sense of what you're saying and i would couch it in this be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And that's how I would kind of characterize a lot of it is it's a lukewarmness that comes upon people, right? Because that tepid water, I was like, yeah, I get it. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. And I mean, that that that's part of the problem, right? I and mean, we've talked about this here is like, um, 
unless you unless you get the means of unless you learn that the only way to be is to be comfortable with being uncomfortable there's really no there's no other real hope for you because you're going to be looking for wherever tepid water you can find right and yes the yeah. lukewarmness is comfort it's comfort yeah it's comfort. And, and it's it's you know it's comfort because it's you comfort. look at like if you were to look at the landscape of where people's attention, like let's say quote unquote influencers and where people's mm -hmm. attention is, mm -hmm. like it's Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan's the most lukewarm yeah. person oh, yeah. that, that oh, person yeah. person and so, like brand that there could yeah. possibly be. I want to I yeah. ask about that because I've seen, first off, I just want to say I would like one day to make it through a whole episode without mentioning either Kanye or Jordan Peterson, but that's fine. <laughs> it's not this time. It'll be the next time, hopefully. But the um that's our version of being from the 90s, I guess. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh so I've actually wanted to ask about Joe Rogan because he's one of those guys I missed on both sides, kind of like Jordan Peterson. When I was woke, I avoided Jordan Peterson by the time I had kind of repented of that. I had, he was already kind of on the other side of like, oh, well, he'd already had his problem with the benzos mm -hmm. and come out and still had like not really become, uh, you know, mm -hmm. been accepted or been baptized or whatever. Um, and it's kind of the same with Joe Rogan. By the time I had kind of flipped, he had already kind of come out and been like, well, you know, he's obviously in support of abortion. I think he's mm -hmm. like uh, obviously a huge psycho not um, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I wanted to ask both of you like what what's is this is this dude pretty moderate is he like because if he's Can you say one thing though i just want to say one thing going further because i just i just want to remind everyone we talked about this before but i want to remind everyone don't don't misunderstand at least what i'm saying here about lukewarm um because if you're comfortable being angry all the time right then when someone feeds you anger, you're still comfortable. Yeah. It's right. just it's it's real important that people don't take what I'm saying as everything needs to be middle of the road. Yeah. Don't don't rock. That's not what I'm talking about, lukewarm, right? right comfortable. I'm talking mm -hmm. about whatever you're used to. Mm -hmm. If you're used to being mad at the wokes, then they're just gonna give you more mad at the wokes. If you're used to being mad at the Trumpers, you're just gonna get more mad at, and that's you're comfortable in that. That that's I, that's I want to put that out there to kind of discern and go deeper. Like I think what the thing is, because right again, forgive me, Andrew. I, just, okay. I, I told this I don't want you to lose your your spot. But this is why I think you know beyond like whatever. This is the project, right? So this is the this is the public service announcement, right? So what it, what is it? Like so we're in Lent, right? Well, it's built into the it's built into the tradition. It's built into the system, right? There's these moments. Yeah, I remember back in the day when I was, you know, kind of coming up in the libertarian ranks, and there was the talk of like, well, it's designed. It'll be the best way to do it is designed to fundamentally undo itself, which is baloney, whatever. But the church does it, right? At least, you know, you don't have to. You can find your own hacks and loopholes, and people do it all the time. But that's what Lent is. Lent is, you know, Lent is a lot of things. Lent is a tithe. It's a tithe to the Lord. Yes, right? But it's also where we remind ourselves we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's, right, that's paradise, right? That play, we, we can only enter into it by being uncomfortable. And that is how you stay awake. That's how you stay vigilant, right? If you're watching on the wall, you don't get vigilant by like, you know, getting warm or by cooling yourself off in the shade. Like You have to be, uncomfortable so that you can stay watchful and that has to be not just a prerequisite but an ethos that has to be an ethos by which you live so forgive me i'll shut up i just wanted well, to throw that out there no this is actually what i did want to dive into so scrap that joe rogan question this is what i wanted to dive no into. i think it's a hold on andrew i think it's a good question that you're asking sure like well, i think i think it's a good question because he Clearly, he represents something, That's and he my... represents something that is totally of this age. Like total, he is a man. He is the man of this age, I would say. Like where he holds these views that don't really fit into the boxes that we had before, 
but yet he it makes fits it comfortable into a box. That's the thing. It fits he, into a specific box yeah. of this age. See, yeah. Joe Rogan embodies what Cyprian's kind of like teasing out. He embodies. He, it's he, if you could point to anybody, right? You could point to Joe Rogan to make the kind of alt media conspiracy theory thing popular. It's it's Joe Rogan. Because anyone who listens to Joe Rogan, you listen to Joe Rogan. What do you like about Joe Rogan? Well, you like that you're learning something. You're hearing something that no one else is hearing. You're getting a perspective that no one else has got. You're getting great information, right? Because that's the thing about Joe Rogan, right? Great interviewer. And he's, he's never offended about. anybody. Forgive me, Father. He's, yeah. you will nev- the one thing that you will never hear anybody say is that I was offended by it. Maybe his guest, but you've never been offended by Joe Rogan. No one has ever been offended by Joe Rogan. His well, they tried to cancel him. Remember that? But that's because he was bringing on certain guests, right? But they weren't offended by him because it's never the words out of his mouth that do it. But didn't he say it? Wasn't he the person? And we can't talk about it here because big, big YouTube will slap us down. But like, the wasn't he the person espousing the beliefs? Wasn't he the person saying? No, like even then, even then he was lukewarm, right? He was like, I'm not saying it's this. I'm not saying it's that. It's just, I want to take X or I want to take, but it's the same dude. He was testing all, he was making all of his guests get tested before they could come on. He was making his staff get tested every day, man, every day. This is the kind of stuff I don't know about, like, because Mm -hmm. I was never really on with this guy. So, but he didn't pass the purity test. And I think that that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, there was hot and cold going on in that discussion. And on either side, like the people who were on the, let's say the cold side, which would be sort of more the side that we were leaning to, if I'm gonna use this metaphor, not to say we were cold, but on one side of it, people were passionate. On the other side, people were passionate, right? But there was one side that had all the power to cancel. And if you didn't pass their purity test, even by one inkling, so like it didn't matter that he was openly being like, no, I'm testing even all these celebrities. I'm forcing these celebrities if they want to come on, they have to get tested. Right. But and then he was like, well, maybe I would take it. Maybe I wouldn't, because if you requ- remember, he was actually scheduled to go and get it. I don't and then he got sick. And mm-hmm. so then he was like, oh, well, then I'll go and get the therapeutics. Right. And so we got oh, yeah, all the therapeutics. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. I forgot about the therapeutics. That's right. Yeah. yeah so, so he went and got all the therapeutics. That's what they canceled him for, really. Yeah. So, yeah. Was because he said that they worked. Right. Yeah. But again, that's like totally lukewarm. Yeah. So he was, he would go take the, the jabby jab. He was willing yeah. to take the jabby jab. Right. But it just so happened that he got sick and couldn't do it. This. Okay. So say that. Say that a person, you know, is kind of following this path that you guys are lining out a little bit about, like, they're not particularly oriented towards Christ, but through kind of cultural osmosis or whatever, they're starting to pick up that like, hey, you know, there might be something deeper going on here. And maybe they even start getting like, you know, talk, you know, asking for a friend, you know, what if like, they're really, really (laughs) their continued pattern is to kind of just get mad at like let's say the left and that kind of anger that is comes with that father or cyprian either one is there what would you like recommend for that like what would be something that would be what's the what's the what's the counter to that you know you know there's fasting there's repentance but sometimes we can there's something a little bit more specific about that that you can kind of hone in on so what i'm hearing correct me if i'm wrong is if you're not oriented towards christ and you start to become maybe even a little bit awakened to this, the anger that is tempted or the, sorry, the emotion that you're very tempted to, like, you know, a friend of mine was, was a lot of anger was getting very angry and starting to just be like, all these blue haired Antifa, whatever's blah, blah, blah. Not knowing that like father said, the reaction is part of the spell as well. Like your, your reaction, your um, anger, your frustration is part of that spell. What's something that you would, you know, necessarily like prescribe as, you know, a priest to help counter, to help counter that. Well, see, this can open a whole other thing. I mean, this is why I think it's so important to build. 
it's so important to build because um, the conservative quote unquote wants to preserve, what are they preserving, right? And the left quote unquote, you know, the party of envy wants to destroy, you know? And I think it's important to build. And I say that, you know, uh, much love and respect to anyone who's listening like in a traditional culture, like, you know, to the Serbian listeners, like they would need to conserve. They need to conserve their heritage, right? Um, but for us in the States, us in the West, us in the new world, it's a matter of building. And that's, that's the weird spot we find ourselves in, but I think we just need to lean into that. So in other words, like for instance, there's there's all these great places, let's say, I say that loosely about like intersection in which we can like find commonality, right? Um, we can find commonality with a kind of just a more general Christian confession, talking about things like Moloch worship, um, you know, the alphabet soup stuff, all that, right? But fundamentally, I'm all about the need for us to build, right? Because until he comes and we need to live like, you know, he's going to come tomorrow, but he may not come for another four generations. We need to leave that proper inheritance for our kids. And so I think putting your mindset of building, that's what helps you kind of navigate and, and maybe would instill this desire to become you know, immune or have some sort of um, immunity to this lukewarm disposition that we're speaking of, right? Because if it's just about conserving in our context, again, you know, if you're in Serbia, if you're in Russia, if you're in Romania, that's different because you're trying, there is something to conserve. There's, there's authentic soil in a cradle, an Orthodox cradle, but here there, we don't have that. So we need to build. And that building, I think, is what can inspire a lot of people to move outside of themselves, which is what you need to do. You need to move outside yourself and be thinking about, you know, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, you know what I mean? Like, um, and that's everything from building schools to building temples to, um, you know, building, you know, this, people are just turning this off today, but, <laughs> but, you know, building, building like businesses and like, you know, I mean, there's something I'm like, look, part of what's happened is the principalities embody as large corporations, which are killing culture, killing mom and pop stores, right? More than having the freedom to, you know, have your own kind of uh, economic, you know, future that you want to determine, like beyond that, the reality is, is that when people have businesses, small businesses, they're able to participate in the building of culture. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, the kind of coffee shop where people are going to be able to listen to music and, you know what I mean? And, and or, 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 you know, a newsstand, new, newsstand, what am I talking about? Like bookstore, like, you know, whatever the thing is, I don't want to limit it to just a certain thing. But I, I think that when we see, these strong pushes to get rid of physical media, mm -hmm. to make everything digital, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. when we see these strong pushes to really um, have gatherings only done in a certain context, like I'll tell you like an example, like um, there is a local coffee shop, shout out to Sister Anne's that we go to. And, you know, I just, you know, I've heard from them, it's like, man, there's like this, there's this one conglomerate that's been, basically bought up all the coffee shops in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And they're like one of just only a couple that haven't sold, even though they may still have their same names, like they're, mm -hmm. they're they, but they're owned by this conglomerate, right? That's the type of thing I'm talking about. And so I think if someone wants to, cause it, it, it isn't just enough to, and hopefully we're always trying to move past this is, yeah, the personal piety is great. And that's what Lent's about. Say the same there from prayer. And if you want to do it on a on a real individual micro level, say the same up in prayer, you know, get get down with your priest and really work out your salvation. Okay. But let, let's go a little bit broader, a little bit higher than that. And let's mm -hmm. to get into like what does it look like to build art? What does it look like to 
to hold ground until he comes? You know, what does it look like to make outposts by which, um, you know, the faithful can gather, but which also, you know, lost sheep can find themselves in the pinfold, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's where this idea of, and I, I'm all for this, you know, because we need more priests for sure, but not as many as people think, you know what I mean? Like we need people who are doctors, we need people who are mechanics, we need people who are baristas, we need people who are comic book writers, we, we need people in all the echelons to form and build culture. And that's why, you know, I look at something like, I, I think that was part of the selling shtick when they were trying to do the push with the Daily Wire. I feel like mm-hmm. that was part of the thing, make a concerted culture. But man, you know, broken clock's right twice in the day. You know, right. I, I'm 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 all for that, you know, but I'm all for building for for Christ, you know, and and, and so the thing for us is it's incumbent upon us as Orthodox or those who are becoming Orthodox in the new world in the West mm-hmm. to really make that possible. And e- and even especially in light of what we're talking about, knowing that there's certain institutions that have the the facade, have the edifice of being quote unquote orthodox, but they're, you know, the outside of the cup is clean, but the inside's not so clean. Sure. Right. Mm. So I just, you know, forgive me, I know people, I'm not trying to be whatever hyperdox about things. But I'm just saying this is just a reality, right? Because, you know, um there's there's things that there's things that would hallmark what I'm talking about, like a certain integrity, right? What kind of integrity? Well, I'm not picking on the guy, although I am, who cares, whatever. But just, if I was, if I was like that, um, if I was the kind of um, stalwart, sweater-wearing Catholic guy, you know, um, and I was like, yeah, I was all into it, and you know, I, I read stuff, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't get over the lack of ecclesial discipline for Joe Biden. I couldn't get over it. Mm. Right. I couldn't get over it. If I was that guy, right. Brian Holdsworth guy, whatever. If I was that guy, I'd be like, I can't do this. You know what I mean? The lack of integrity would just kill me. Right. Um, So that's kind of what I mean. And that's one of the great things about being, you know, Orthodox here in the new world is that, even though you got, you know, a certain archbishop who, you know, stamps everything that Biden and, and you know, certain three-letter agencies does, I can look at that and go like, well, he ain't my bishop. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I can and I can live in integrity. And I know some people aren't gonna like that stance, but you know, I'm taking the stance of someone who has children, who has a parish, who has people who want to do the right thing they want to navigate these waters and they don't want to just lay down and die. And I, I don't think we should. I think that we have to build in order to kind of answer Andrew's question, like, well, what do you do? How do you navigate it? I think that's how you navigate it. Cause you get invested. And once you're invested, it's like the renter never cares as much as the landowner. Right. Does that it, make sense? It makes a, it makes a lot of sense. And it's something that I've been, it's some, It's this concept or idea that has occurred to me with, because, you know, there have been a lot of young men around me sort of shortly preceding and then following my conversion who I guess were probably on their way to orthodoxy and perhaps, mm. you know, my conversion was a great mercy and that they saw, oh, here's an example and it's not so weird and I can do it or whatever. Mm. Um mm but it seems that that group has been steadily growing in my own circle. But one of the things that has, it's given me a weird feel, like a strange feeling of like something is not right is, and now mind you, this isn't with, let's say all of these young men, because I think some of these young men have like embraced the church, but also fallen into the rhythm of the church, which then by default put them in a position where they were building. But one of the things that I think is the hallmark of the men who do fall into the properly into the rhythm and are oriented toward Christ 
and it goes to the hot or cold, not lukewarm thing is that it's like, it seems that there are really only two, let's say, paths for a man in the church. And, and, you know, along that path, you may then get called to the priesthood, like on either one of these paths. But it seems that the two paths are either monastic or father. Mm -hmm. Like there isn't, there isn't, there aren't any other path. There isn't a lukewarm path in between those two. Like Mm -hmm. either go be, go find a wife and be a father. You're orthodox, Mm -hmm. man. You're an adult. Mm -hmm. Go Mm -hmm. find a man, be a father, take on the responsibilities that require you to be in the world, but not of it and do the things to raise a family. Maybe you get called to the priesthood. Maybe you do not. Or go be a monastic and maybe you get called to the priesthood and maybe you do not. But like head Mm -hmm. off to the monastery or head off to a wife. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. And, and, And what I'm seeing from a lot of this crop of young men is I'm like, there's no movement in those directions. Yeah, Although okay, so, there's this broad thing of like, oh, no, but I'm embracing orthodoxy full on. And it's yeah, like, no, 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 no. This is the first thing. Okay. So this is, man, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've just God seen bless. it, Father, no, for no, years no, no, now. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? So, so, so I just want to kind of like, whatever, pull me back in. You know, you know, I'm going to get just pull me okay. back in. All right. Just All whatever, right. right. But I talk about this with the sisters a lot. Right. And just to give some context, like the sisters, like, like there's four nuns, right? Three of the nuns are under 40. One is, you know, in, in her uh, 70s, right? Late 60s or 70s, right? So there's a generational gap there. And pull it back in. Don't let me get whatever. I'm trying to go somewhere, right? But I, I talk so much about this because um, it's it's like one of the things there's, there's a couple core things that if I was to sit down and maybe I'll do that in the book I'm supposed to be writing, but we'll never do it, whatever. But like, there's these things that are so particular now, right? Um, emotions, right? I've talked about this before. Emotions, right? And, and having emotional intelligence and like, you know, in the same way you could say some people need to maybe do the 12 steps before they become orthodox, And an even broader sense, I would say a lot of people, and I'm going to get there, especially in certain generations, need to have some sort of grounding and movement towards garnering greater emotional intelligence. Not let's say before they become orthodox, but in order for them to progress in orthodoxy, they need to do that. Mm. Right? And it's a very much a generational thing because what I have observed, and we can pull this all apart, and remember, I think it was last year, whatever, there was the whole millennial thing. I don't want to go down that road, you know, pulling out, calling out one thing. But I will say this, I've observed it because, you know, and shout out to you, you know who you are, uh, young man that I'm talking to. Um, Cause I'm telling them the same thing. Uh, you're sick. You're sick. I don't mean sick as in like, I'm disgusted by you. I mean like, you're sick. Well, you're reaching out to me. I'm gonna help you, right? You're sick. Your inability right, which your inability to make a movement, part of the way I want to help you is you need to see that your inability is actually an unwillingness, right? That's the first thing, is owning that. Owning the inability is actually an unwillingness to make a move is the way out of it. Because that is one of the hallmarks of these current, of however you want to phrase it, right? I'm going to be more general so that I can keep people in the conversation and they don't get clicky, clickety-clack about defending millennials or Zoomers. Who cares, right? But this movement of not being able to make a not be able to make a move, right? It's a problem because it's antithetical to the spiritual life, right? Saint Sophroni, he talks about the spiritual life is like being in the British Army during World War II. If you go backwards, you're gonna get shot for being a traitor. There's no backwards, there's no retreat. So the only thing is to move forward, right? Even if like it, it seems like it's the end of you. You have to move forward because going backwards is certain death. At least with moving forward, there is a horizon of potential, right? Getting especially men to do this because what I've found, interestingly enough, the women have their own set of problems. They have their own kind of sickness, but they still 
need and desire that man to kind of help them to hitch them to pull them and when them and when these men are just and now paralysis of analysis at best if not just flat out just doe-eyed and terrified um it it's it really is a type of spiritual and psychological sickness that i think there are I'm sure I, I know of some priests who kind of are trying to approach it. I know I don't know much about it, but I know there's like a like a St. Pisces Brotherhood, I think, that was trying to address some of these things. But a lot of that is so centered around um masturbation and like porn, which is a part of it. I mean, that's what facilitates a lot of it, but it's so much bigger than that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and so much bigger than that in the sense of I don't like here's another thing. Like I would talk about emotions, right? I would talk about generation gap and understanding your generation and having to navigate the issues of your generation, right? But something else that I would talk about that I feel like people don't really talk about is the one of the big things about coming to orthodoxy and whatever you think you want to get out of orthodoxy, you're only going to get out of it through repentance. And what I mean by repentance isn't just how we always talk about it, but actually this transformation of your way of being. Because what a lot of people, a lot of these guys wanna do is they think like, okay, I got red pilled or I listened to Jay or whatever the thing is, I'm coming to the church and like, I'm kind of good, everyone else is messed up. And it's like, everyone knows that's my shtick, but like, re remember, okay, great. You're the problem, actually. You're the problem. And unless you kind of hear what I'm saying about your need to change, and not just in the general sense, because this is another key thing. Forgive me. Remember, wheel me back in if I'm just if I'm going crazy. But no, I see where you're going. I, you're you're like, still on track, Father. Like this thing, this is a little sidetrack, but you know, just to help people out, when you say like I'm a sinner, that's actually a distraction. That's a, that's that's a little bit of camouflage. Oh, I'm a sinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who isn't right? You need to talk about your sin, not just in the general sense, right? Because here's the thing. You can only talk about the sin of Adam and Eve until you've made progress, right? So until you've made progress, let's talk about your sin, Jimmy, right? Let's, let's just do that, right? So this is the thing about getting these people to own it because it's in that taking responsibility and the, fu and the fundamental repentance of that, right? Of that inability to take responsibility, which is action, right? This is what's needed. Right. And so that that to me kind of brings me back to the original thing of like building. Right. Because if you're coming in, you're saying like, it's just enough that I'm chosen to be orthodox, whatever that means. But you're still, you know, if, if you're still, forgive me, whatever. Um, if you're still living in mom's basement and not planning to get out, but you're like orthodox and you're yelling at mom because, you know, she's, She's listening to like, you know, Celine Dion and, and going to the Episcopal Church. Like, you missed it, Jack. Yeah. Like, you should shut up, not bother your mom or your auntie or whoever. And you need to get out and get a job at the at the stinking hard, you know, hardware store, you know, start going whatever, get a wife. Like, you know what I'm saying? You need to take those practical steps. And here's why. Because this isn't about like, and I just want to say this. I'm not if you think I'm talking about red pill right now, I think you totally are missing what I'm saying. You're totally missing what I'm saying, right? That's part of the problem is the red pill cats that come in and like, I'm based, I'm red pill, blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, but what's your fruit? Which, where's the fruit? What are you building? Because a lot of these cats, they come in, they're tearing down. They spend more time tearing down everything else than they are building something else of their own or for the body, right? So what I like to see is, you know, there's there's a, there's a you know, I'm just saying, there's a young guy at the parish that has a catechism. He's one of those guys, you know? And I think he felt it. I think he felt me giving him the side eye. But now I see him, he's volunteering a lot. He's, you know what I mean? That's what I'm talking about. He's actually getting out of the basement getting out of, you know, off the webs, whatever, and actually getting in the physical, tangible space and doing stuff around the parish. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, Father, how refreshing is that to see? 
is that like incredibly refreshing to see? I bet that's like a like a cold drink on a hot day for a priest. Man, lemonade, that cold, refreshing drink. I am. It gives me hope. Yeah. It gives me hope because that's the thing is, like whatever. <laughs> I don't. I don't need to have my other leg broken, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> like. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't want people just kind of hearing me flap and whatever. I want people to understand, like, no, like fruit, you know, fruit. And and that's the thing. Like, that's why I bring up the nuns too, is because you have, you know, four nuns, but you have three of them under 40 who are repenting of their mm. generational sins, mm. right? Of these mm. things that plague women, right? And we need to see more of that with men. And how's that going to happen? Well, for these women, they learned what more women need to learn. They're learning it by becoming monastics. That's their repentance. Mm -hmm. That's their action. So men need to learn this. You need to get married to repent of that, you know, being like yep. a, 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 a spineless worm, whatever. Or you mm -hmm. need to become monastic. But either way, you need to do violence mm -hmm. to, to the, the world around you by creating Right. You mm -hmm. do that by, by seizing the kingdom through creating, through building, right? Building a family. And monastics have families. Yep. That's what a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a skeet is. It's a family in Christ. So either way, you need to build a family. You know what I mean? And in a family, you pull away. Mm -hmm. It's forced, it's forced in, in a way, it's like whether by the rule that is given to you in the monastery or by the rule that is if you're you know halfway decently healthy even if you're relatively spiritually sick god is still going to give you that fatherly rule once that baby is born mm -hmm. like it's god, god's going to give it to you you know what i mean that's <laughs> like no. that, that's so... 85% of my repentance right there is just like <laughs> oh wow and i think and i think i'll say it because whatever people can come after me and i'm not going to go too hard but the millennial i can only speak for millennial but the millennial selfishness is unbelievably pervasive it is unbelievably like it it infects everything and like well it's infects is the right word well yeah it's, it's because a it's promise. a sickness well the mm -hmm. very first thing that father said was owning there's mm -hmm. very little of that there is incredibly just a small amount of that is like of like how often it is someone else's fault that they are doing mm -hmm. this thing and like how often it is like you know i i was working with a guy and he was like four or five years older than me and he he was incredibly until he actually had a uh, logos in greek tattooed on his arm mm -hmm. and so i was like well there's an end point right there and then he was listening to a black metal band that I was never really into. So we got to talking and everything is just, well, it's just, well, and now everything is someone else's fault. My life sucks. There's nothing I can do about it. I keep reaching out for help. No one can really help me, you know? And I'm just like, well, I mean, where's your part in this? He's like, my part is sitting back and just getting crapped on. That's my part. <laughs> all of this. And I'm like, I was like, you are really, really lucky that I'm not allowed to smack people. I want more. <laughs> I would really just like, as a counselor is like, if I could just get one smack during the entire time that we work together, that would be great because this would be the time I would use it because the very first step that father mentions is the owning and nobody does that. Like not, I don't want to generally speaking, the people I work with, it's everyone else's fault. It's, it's not them. It's their neurodivergence. No one recognized. Oh, oh man. man. Well, I think, I think it is the <laughs> lack of, I think this building piece is really important. Like it's occurring to me that, that this is, it's very important because it actually, it actually is the protocol whereby you realize that you're sick. If that makes sense, that it's well, sort of like, it's sort of like you you say, okay, I'm gonna go build. And then you just be very honest with yourself as you begin because it's because it's then like, okay, I'm gonna go build. Uh I'm not getting out of the basement. And it's mm -hmm. like, why are you not getting out of the base? And you're like, why am I not getting out of the basement? And then it should be like, oh, I'm sick. Because now you could start to measure mm -hmm. uh, like, are you are you becoming 
progressively more healed, right? It's like, Father, I'm going to use your like your like your leg as an example, right? That it's like you gotta if you if you are like, well, tr- have you tried walking at all on your leg? And then so mm-hmm. and then the person's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to continue to wait until it's completely healed. And it's like, well, how will you know when it's healed? Yeah. If you mm-hmm. never put any weight on it, how will you know when it's healed? And Andrew, I think that that's really what you're describing. Like that, that's, it's the, really the unwillingness to even take one step to be able to be like, well, ha- how much can you do until you can't do it? Like well, just yeah. get to that point and then you'll actually know where your sickness lies for you to begin to address. And see, and this is really key. This is really key because- this is where I stand by this. I go, orthodoxy is the, the cure for every problem. Yes. Liter- literally every single problem, right? Black people, what's your problem? They're not orthodox. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Millennials, what's your problem? You're not orthodox. You know what I mean? Drug addict, what's your problem? You're not orthodox, right? And what do I, what's the qualification? What do I mean? Do I mean like you're a card carry member of institution? No, no, no. I mean, that you are grafted in and you are chasing with the help of God, God himself, right? And you are and you are recognizing the high calling you have of being a human being, right? And the high calling of a human being recognizes that you have responsibility because you have power because you've been endowed with that. Doesn't matter what your state of life is, right? Because that dignity, whether you're a slave or whether you're a soldier, right? You're always looking to become a son. That, that is what keeps you moving. That's what keeps you going. And that's that's the biggest thing is that this understanding, it's fundamental to or to having, that is like, you know, no pun intended, that is the orthodox ethos, which is you bear the cross, right? You bear the cross. And what's funny is the, I find this fascinating because um, I'm going to have to go against, he's already been mentioned once, but I mentioned twice, you know, forgive me. It's the one thing that is like worthy of passing on to someone that like JP has kind of, you know, he gets, he gets that aspect of it, which is good. Right. And again, a broken clock is right twice in a day. But I think that reality of, of recognizing the need to just kind of own whatever part you can. And instead of making it be like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that's not right. I mean, embrace what's been given to you. Let's look at it that way. Let's not make it, you know, bootstraps and like you're, you know, you're just a, a piece of crap. Uh, let's make it like, hey, recognize what you've been given. You know, all of your search for empowerment in all these other ways is actually not empowering you. It's quite the opposite, right? Anything that's trying to pass the buck, right? So how do we do it? You you say to yourself, I don't know where, but it's simple, right? I feel like I'm about to lead someone to the sinner's prayer. <laughs> You just say, you just go, I don't know where, but I know I have one place of responsibility. Where is that God? See, that's a prayer. I'll put money down and bet my big toe. That's a prayer that if someone means it, will get answered. Yeah. I, I don't know where it is, God, but I know there's at least one place in which I have responsibility. Show me what it is. And if someone was to pray that honestly and act upon it, their life would change. Well, but forgive and- me, forgive me, Father. I think the the only way to pray that honestly, though, because I've prayed it, <laughs> so I could speak to it. The scary part about praying that honestly is the that the additional part is, and once you show it to me, I will take what you show me. Mm-hmm. Like, and once it is mm-hmm. shown to me, I will do it, regardless yeah. of what it is yeah. that you show to me. Yeah, like. yeah, that's that's even more important, right? That's even but that's important. so scary. I think that's like the amount of courage, like that's because w- that's wading into war, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. like, okay, you're the general. I know that there's spiritual warfare, Lord. Um, okay, I've got my helmet on. I've got my boots on. Uh, okay, send me into battle. And, you know, if you send me to be a communications officer behind the, you know, in, in headquarters, then that's where I'm going. And if you send me off on a suicide mission, then Lord, that's where I'm going. But like, I, I I'm here, like I'm ready. How could that not yep. get answered? <laughs> you know yep. what I mean? Yeah. And, and what's interesting is that was, sorry, Andrew, it's okay. like in, in the lectionary today, right? 
if we're following those of us on the old calendar, right? The reading in Isaiah. Here I am, Lord, send me. Right? That was today. That was the reading today. So it's, that's very much the spirit. Sorry, Andrew. No, it's okay. I was because I just read that. And I don't remember that part. I just remember the part where the angel took the coal mm -hmm. and put, placed it on the tongue. I was like, ah, mm -hmm. I know what that is. I know what your mm -hmm. dad's talking about there. Um, mm -hmm. but I think that is one of the um, you know, again, my compliments to God, where that like you <laughs> have to like uh really recognize what the what having children is because like I said a couple minutes ago, it's like that's about 85% of my repentance is just recognizing like how incredibly selfish I was. I, I thought I was a pretty kind and patient person before I had children, before I had the amount of children I have. And just, um, you know, like uh, just waking up, I forget there's a prayer, um, but it's like, you know, grant, it's like in, in the drudgery of the next day or something like that. And like grant me mm -hmm. the strength for the drudgery of the next day or something. Mm -hmm. and it's like, I feel that now. Like, I truly feel that like, and, and not only that, but like the joy of the cross, like the joy of like being able to like, I would have never experienced this moment if it were up to me and how I perceived it or not. If I, if I were set up with the circumstances of, of creating a moment, it would have never been this one. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like I would have mm -hmm. never chosen for beauty to be shown to me this way for like, for me, for me to like, look up from changing like wrist deep in poop. And like, mm -hmm. like having a screaming kid behind me for snacks while I'm doing that, while my wife is just trying to get gas in the car, whatever, whatever. And then looking up and seeing like my daughter, you know, like I'm just making something up, but like, you know, because there's so much chaos recognizing like, oh, I should pray the Trisagion. Like, so she, with her little tiny fingers, like lights a candle and puts it there and then starts saying like quietly to herself. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is beautiful. And I would have never, ever, if it were up to me, this moment would have never happened because everything would be beautiful. Like everything would be wonderful all the time, but because this set of circumstances happens in the midst of so much trial and so in the midst of so much turmoil, it's like finding like a flower on like a battlefield or something like that, where it's just like, Oh, but like oh. that's like I've said it before. Right. That's at least for me, that's how I know. That's how I know I have Christ is because I have crosses I would have never picked. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and then, then that speaks to, well, I guess I just, I don't know myself at all because I don't, there is a complete lack of awareness about myself that I think is pretty common against across the generation of millennials. Again, I can only speak to that because I'm a millennial, but this whole like, what do you think your problem is? And I know what the, I don't know what the problem is, but I know you're a pretty selfish human being. And that's what I'm thinking in my brain when I'm asking this person, like, what do you think your problem is? Like, well, I think that I just have a lot of trauma from blah, blah, blah. You know, my grandma dying like five years ago. And I, I'm like, there's just a complete lack of awareness. And, I, and I've heard that said about influencers, influencers, whatever people who are taking really, really silly pictures of themselves and stuff like that, like thinking they look cool. It's a complete lack of self-awareness. It's like, okay, so there's just no self-awareness because there's a complete inability to own or understand yourself in any real way. It's all And I think, but see, part of that too is that this gets us back a little bit to what was in between the lines of the, the earlier part of the conversation because they don't have the prototype. They don't have the the prototype to compare to. And that that's a big problem too is that, you know, it's like, the orthodox what do we have i mean that that's what i mean whatever's whatever but that <laughs> it's, it's funny someone last week they they put in a comment there like blah 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 whatever like blah. what are you talking about yeah exactly that's us <laughs> that's so great. they were pulling the, they were pulling they're 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 pulling out our uh there's a term for there's a term for that there's a term for for when you do that thing, and it, and they exist in every language, and they're fun to hear in every language. But oh, it's, You're for about people like, to know yada, what yada, it, yada 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 okay. this and that, what it what it is is it is that your brain is moving 
at a faster speed than your body can keep up with. Your your cognition is moving at a faster speed. And people should appreciate those things because you know what it means? It means that the person is trying to get to the more important thing that their mind has already hit upon that their <laughs> mouth hasn't gotten to yet. So whenever you hear that, embrace it because it means that this person is working hard for you. Otherwise, they They're wouldn't have that and they'd slowly go stuff. through. They're, They're slipping, sk skipping a bunch, bunch of, of, of a bunch of stuff that you wouldn't want to hear anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So great. Anyways, whoever you were, and I hope you meant it in, in with malice, because that would make it even sweeter. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyways, uh, yeah, so I remember the <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Um, but I wanted to actually ask about this, since we have probably a decent amount of time to talk about this, is... Um, so I, I have been diagnosed with ADHD. Now, I don't know what that is. I don't know what ADHD mm -hmm. is. And like, I know for sure I have something. I don't know what it is, but, it, and I'm not, and I, I loathe the term neurodivergent. I loathe it. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what it means, but it's just one of those pop turns. that's going to be gone in five years to be replaced by something else. But I actually kind of wanted to ask father, if you had any thoughts like, speaking of because that's that is something that has been coming up a lot recently is for me at least and maybe again it's an echo chamber because i've looked into what adhd is but it seems like the amount of people who are diagnosing themselves with or being diagnosed adhd seems to be rising it's one of those and it and it fills me with dread because it's fills it's one of those like things that's going to be here for a year where suddenly everybody's like, I think my problem is I have ADHD. Like, I think I'm just not registering reality in the way that I'm supposed to be, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well then, is this going to detract from the people like me? And I'm sure there are millions of us who genuinely, when I'm not on my medication, when I'm not doing whatever, whatever, whatever exercises I do to kind of keep it in check, that it genuinely does get really, really bad. Like, like the, the, because what does really, really bad mean? Like what happens? Well, I I'm mean, curious. so the hallmarks would be an intense level of procrastination, um, the complete, like, I'm well, not the complete, a, a severe inability to pay attention whatsoever. Like, I cannot pay attention to like to what, though? Could you read a comic book that you really were into? So you're... this is the thing about ADHD, as, as I've come to understand it, a comic book would not be the problem. Uh, the comic book would for the while I was reading a comic book, I would be fine. Because it is enough stimulation that it it grabs a hold of me. It's the same with a video game. It's the same with drugs. It's like it, it so overwhelms the senses that it is completely able to rein in your attention. It's the putting what happens when you put the comic book down and then you have to go fix the car. So when you have to go fix the so car. So it's a it desensitization. I guess I've never thought of it like that, but I think that that's probably the way. Like it's a tolerance. It's basically it's a tolerance to novelty. Well, sure. I would say maybe maybe that's part of it. But I would say like if if it is something minute, if it's something that needs that requires attention, I just can't do it. Like I mean, it's not that I can't. I've I've tried. I've tried my entire life to do it, and that that, that part of the brain just doesn't seem to turn on. It. I don't know. It. I would probably to give a full example, a full like detailed analysis of what I think it is. All I can really talk about is what I've observed. I would probably need a little bit of time to prepare that, but as of right now, as I'm, as I'm talking to you guys, it'd be like, I w didn't know if father had any thoughts and cause it's not what they say it is. And what they say it is, is it's chemical imbalance exacerbated by certain factors, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. So I didn't know if you had any thoughts father or if I'm putting you to, is there anyone I well, hold on before, before like, cause I'm trying to understand this too, because I'm seeing it a lot. My question is, is there anybody who, from what you describe, like, is there anybody who doesn't have that? Like, isn't that just a part of being human? Like, isn't that a part of having a value hierarchy of like things that interest you and things that don't that like, I find this boring and therefore I don't want to be here, or I find this incredibly interesting and therefore I do want to be here. And the things that we don't find interesting, but need to be done, we would much less rather do than the things that we find super interesting and fun so, and stimulating to us. What I, like, what I would say in response to that, Cyprian, is 
I love you. You're a good dude. Yes, go ahead. That sounds a little bit like an, a non-alcoholic saying to an alcoholic, well, why don't you just quit drinking? As no, like, no, 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 no. I'm not. No, no, no. It isn't that. It isn't that. It is, and I hope that you don't take it that way. I hope that you don't take it that way well, because I'm also saying that I'm I'm susceptible to it too, right? Like okay. I've got tons of stuff on my plate all the time. I've got a whiteboard full of things that I want to that because that need to need be done that. because you need that. No, they need to be done, right? But like, there's this this uh, and even Father talking about writing a book, right? I've written three. There's a there's this quote by a really famous author, and I'm forgetting who it is, a novelist. And he says, my house is never so clean as when I have a book to write. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Absolutely. My house is never so clean as when I have a book to write. And it's like sort of and. But like, I think that you could probably there's no doubt. And that there's a reason why. Uh, authors, p guys who write books, like coffee and cigarettes is all the time there. I know that this, the fact that I have this like thing that I have all these things on the board and then I'm like, I really don't want to do them right now. You know what I'm off to? Caffeine. And like, you know what the, and, and like Ritalin, like the medicine and stuff that they give for ADHD is like, it's speed. It's meth And so it's, it's methamphetamine, right? So it's a stimulant. And it's just like, I'm not so sure that like everybody doesn't have a proclivity to this in being human. But what I'm thinking is that like those of us who have experienced more novelty, like who have had our, who have been stimulated with drugs, sex, these things right that are like who have had experiences that are hyper stimulating have probably knocked off the bottom rung of mundanity right so that it's almost like we ha we ca we're completely unmotivated and can't find any novelty in those things but what and i think it may just be a natural part of being i mean this is my own because what no. you're describing i have that's why i'm saying it i would but i would never call it adhd I would completely agree with you to the point of what would then be the the reason for like an eight-year-old having it. Well, like like video games, like TV and video sure. games. Sure. Sure. I mean, absolutely. Well, isn't it isn't the rise of video games and TV didn't video games and TV and like kids watching hours and hours and hours of them and playing them, didn't that directly coincide with ADHD diagnoses? I would, I don't have the, Hey, I don't have the data. In I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure but I would, I mean, I would say probably like, I mean, I was in school when I started school, nobody had ADHD. By the time I graduated high school, all the kids had ADHD. Can I make a, can I make a suggestion? Go ahead. Yeah. There's a wonderful book for those who are, who read. Um, it's called the new media epidemic by Jean-Claude Rachet. And I would just, if you want to really kind of, have a cursory kind of introductory understanding. I would just, I would encourage everyone to, to grab a hold of that book. Dr. Larche, he suggests, not in that book, but he suggests elsewhere um, very seriously without being hyperbolic um, that if there was to be some sort of ecumenical council um, or some sort of convening council that would um, seek to address some of the kind of current ills that one of the things that would he would highly suggest is that um, media, new media content would be included legitimately in um, the fasting regimen of the church. Huge. Sure. Um, Huge. I'm not going to say much, but I have some pretty serious, significant experience with this topic. Um, and I'm not going to say much because I, I'm just going to own my ignorance on it. But I can say what I do know. Um, I do know that there is a correlation um, that I've observed with the use of media, in particular, you know, phones, and the exacerbation of mm -hmm. this fact full stop
And <clears throat> I also know that, interestingly enough, right, this is this is a big part of it is that it it, it fundamentally clouds the news. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. People who struggle with this, church going, love God and all that. But their prayer, and especially their prayer moving in the ability to kind of start navigating what we talk a lot about, like the, the kind of more neptic approach to prayer. Um it's not impossible, but it's really difficult for them. Yeah. Is this a, I, is what's coming to my, the phrase that's coming to my mind right now is like the still small voice. Yeah. And being a, you know, having been like in music, but particularly like in the DJ world, I knew a lot of guys who were DJs in their in their early 20s and teens who became very successful who were playing all the time and by their 40s they could barely hear you when you were talking when you were speaking to them like so they so they literally in order to even experience sound in the world sound had the all they could do was be around incredibly loud sound yeah and I, this is well i mean you guys are musicians you you know what I mean? You've experienced this as well, right? People buy the amp for 20 years and then they've got no, you know, they've got no top end. They can't hear, they can't hear birds chirping. They can't hear all of these types of things. And it's just like, when you said it clouds the news, father, it was like, oh, wow. There's, and again, back to the organic as the like incarnational, organic, real aspect of this. You know, and it's not just enough to deal with it on an ideological level or like an intellectual level, like the red pill, like it's not enough. You've got a clouded noose and then it's like there's no amount of YouTube videos that you're going to be able to watch yeah. that's going to uncloud your noose. Yeah, no, quite the opposite. The more that you watch. Oh, that's the, the trick. Problem, yeah. The worse it's going to be. Yeah. Oh, that's so scary right there. That's actually super scary. Yeah. And, and, but this goes to, I think that this brings us full circle back to the danger of swimming in these waters without an orientation toward Christ. Because if you didn't, if you didn't understand, if you don't have an understanding that, like, no, it's a re the noose is a real thing. Mm hmm. Like it's a real thing. It's not something that you've imagined. It's not some sort of uh, 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 social construct or like some sort of cognitive archetype or something like that. It's a real thing, like your heart, like your lungs, like all of that. And it's just the same way that you can't be be dealing with, you know, uh, 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 infected lungs by watching it, watching YouTube videos. Sure. Like you're, you know, the same thing is going to go for your clouded news. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's really, uh, it's really important to understand that this is why. I mean, it's Lent, right? So I just, it's really appropriate to say this. There is no orthodoxy without asceticism. And there's plenty of people like, who, you know, don't understand that. And I'm not trying to be that guy, you know, I just, there are those streams of orthodoxy that they don't really, it, it is a moralistic, ideological, intellectual exercise, academic, academic exercise, you know? But without, without ascetic practice, without praxis, what we're talking about is not only going to be lost on you, but um, you'll be, you know, kind of in this really bad space of thinking that you're in the place, in the art, doing the thing, and couldn't be further from the truth. You know? Would it be prelist? Yeah. Is there and, something and I like that? Uh, sorry. That? Uh, is there something like below prelist? Is there like well, I think I think we can talk about a spectrum, right? Because I was just about to say, 
people think prelates, they always want to think about Saint Lucetus and we want to think about yeah. seeing the, the angel, whatever mystical experience. Yeah. But you know, the, um, Oh man. Um, if you know who you are, God bless you. And I'm just bringing this up because it's pertinent and I appreciate the resolve that we had with our interaction. So God bless you. Okay. Um, but I just had an interaction with a, a, a gentleman who had a pretty, you know, um, he's obviously intelligent and he got hooked or is hooked by some, you know, some sexy philosophical ideology. <clears throat> he wrote me about it, asked me about it. And I was pretty clear without scorch earth. I was just, you know, like, this is really, this is really antithetical to the tradition, you know? And he took that as me saying like, yeah, it's kind of no problem. Right. Um, and so again, if he figures this out, he hears this, you know, I, I mean this with all sincerity, God bless you. I really appreciate your humility. So just know that don't be offended by me bringing this up. Know that you're actually serving your brothers and sisters by actually having this example. But I had to tell him he was deluded because him holding to this ideology, this philosophy, and apparently I, I think I'm not the first, but everyone's kind of like handled it with kid gloves, but you know, um, and I had to tell him like the fact that you even thought that I was somewhat kind of supporting or soft on this shows how deluded you were. Cause there's no way you could have read what I sent you and thought that I was in an agreement with you. And he, re he received it. God bless him. And I mean that. Sure. God bless him. But that's what I mean by the spectrum. But that's prelis too. That delusion of like, yeah, I got this and I can integrate this and I can do that and I can reinvent the wheel and I can slap the orthodox whatever on it. That's So it isn't just a mystical experience. You know, it, I think there's a whole spectrum there. And again, that's why it's um, so important to stay grounded um, and to not look to, you know, kind of come up with your thing. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something. It's a terrible burden to, um, you know, kind of have to bring something forward in regards of like spiritual life and things like that. Like if you're tasked with having to you know, I don't want to use the word being a vanguard because that can rub, rub people the wrong way, but it's not something you take up happily. You know, if God calls you to be like, okay, you know, I want you to speak on this and it's unpopular or whatever. That's never fun. That's never fun, you know? Um, so it's just safer to really kind of stick to the basics and really, you know, work with what you got getting us back to build, get a family or go to the monastery. About to say. Yeah. It's it, the, again, like this building, building as barometer, I guess I'd never really had it laid out in my head or articulated it in, in that way. But, and, and it's, it's like, you know, you, you saying father, where are the fruits? Like, what are the fruits? And I think, the the clearest way that we could examine our own fruits is to be building. Like there's got to be some action, something that we are doing that, that has some sort of feedback to us in an incarnational way that tells us our, whether our theories are right or wrong or work in the world. Because the fact of the matter is orthodoxy is proven to work in the world. Mm -hmm. there's no like you don't have to there's no question you don't have to there's nobody could ever make the argument that orthodoxy can't build civilizations mm -hmm. and nobody can ever make the argument that orthodoxy can't bring people to personal salvation mm -hmm. even i think even the weirdest part about it is even people who aren't orthodox even people who are atheists would can't say if they look at history that orthodoxy as a tradition doesn't build civilizations well, I you just—you simply can't. <laughs> I knew an atheist that said, "Like, well, orthodoxy is the most sound theology." He is staunch atheist. Did not it, it, religion is for weak, stupid people. 
He's like, yeah, but if you look at the theology, I've studied the major theologies of the major religions, Orthodox Christianity is the most sound. I was like, I mean, whoa, it's such imagine a that. I've heard that so many times. I know you guys have heard it. If I was going to be a Christian, I'd be Orthodox. Yeah. You know, and there's a there's a reason for that, you know. Well, and I think like so, like, like so many things, it's like, um, it's something that's kind of i guess i mean you know we've talked on this a million times and i'm probably going to take the most like seventh grade level approach to this but it's like we've you know it's well your body your soul is responding to truth and that's causing like a good feeling in you and that and like be at a very base level you realize oh wow like yeah like i'm seeing something here and then it's that it's when you start to turn around and start to say and and so like even beginning with well we don't really even want you looking at the truth we don't even really want you like acknowledging that very first part of it because even that could be enough to even catch you know the the tail end of god's glory that can be too much for that can be that can be enough to entice a person in because that same person you know i heard it through the grapevine ended up buying an orthodox cross off amazon you know, the three barred cross. Now, I don't know what's up with that. I don't think he's converted or anything, but like, it's like, okay, there's something there. Like he responded to something. So even that truth. So the, one of the ways principalities could even really work through media, whatever, whatever, blah, 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 is to be able to get to a person where like, they are not even willing to look at the truth in the first place. So like, like that owning thing that we talked about a little while ago, like, no, you can't even get there. Because even if you get to a point where like you start to acknowledge maybe some of this is my fault, maybe like I need something bigger than myself, maybe that person is a person, or maybe that God is a person, he's personable, I can reach out to him and he'll help me, we can't even get you there. Because if we get you there, then there's this, you, the, the door is open. So rather to just keep it closed and just dismantle any form of like atten- truth seeking behavior, when we can give you something to placate you in lieu of that truth, such as it's society's fault. It's the patriarchy's fault. It's the liberals' fault. It's Joe Biden's fault. So having that, even that beginning glimpse is something that can't happen. So they're but like, there's there's the parallel with the addiction, right? Because like, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's it's spiritual in nature, and it's like whatever it is that leaves you comfortably yeah, numb. Sure. It doesn't necessarily have to be a chemical that does no. it. An ideology or than, an, a television stimulus can do it just as well. well more often than not, it's not. Because, I mean, if you look at the right. population of people, they're not addicted to drugs, but they're addicted right. to lots and lots of other stuff. And, like, even then, you can see when people enter recovery, they're still addicted to other stuff. There's not to be, I'm not trying to be sexist, but they're one of the clearest examples I first noticed that was, like, women who entered recovery started to dress a little bit more provocatively because yep. they would start to get attention, attention. from men. Addicted and to I'm attention, sure yeah men do it in women like i'm sure that they mm-hmm. start working out a lot more start like you know starting to wear tighter mm-hmm. shirts mm-hmm. i just noticed it more with a couple of women than i knew that went into recovery they just started mm-hmm. to be like you know let it all hang out as it were a little bit more so that you know like oh i'm getting attention like oh there's the dopamine rush mm-hmm. i've been looking for there's that endorphin drop i've been looking for while wow, i look good blah 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 and you know more often than not it can't be a drug because then like the problem with weed is the the outward effects of it would be too observable. It would be too radical. And people would be like, well, we need to do something about this. It would what, what they need is they something need something incredibly pervasive, which I think, you know, no one's here really to listen to my thoughts about this kind of stuff too much. But what I would say is that that's the main problem with weed. It's the the effects of it are so um yeah, they're so easily dismissed. They're so small that a person could subtle. Eat they're it's subtle. very subtle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because speaking as a person who tried marijuana management into my recovery for a little while, at a certain point I was sitting there, you know, what, however months in, going to meetings, but then going home and just smoking pot afterwards. At a certain point, I asked, how is this any different than drinking? The problem is, is my external mm-hmm. circumstances are much better. I've got my own apartment. I'm up to, be- I'm, to I'm up to paying rent. I've got a job. Things are OK, but I'm still dead inside. But like, you know, like, because there's no growth, there's no uncomfort. I'm not being challenged in any way. So Mm -hmm. like tapioca pudding of a self of of a soul 
is being there's no stimulation because instantly I numb everything out. And I, you know, I think that's that's that so it'd have to be that on a large scale. But even then weed is still too outside the cultural norm to a degree to like really have someone that would be the problem to address. It's it's got to be something like media fashion you are who you are you're your own boss you can define yourself mm -hmm. blah 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 all those things that give you an ego boost to, to kind of you know you know those there's what is it like um in the proverbs what are the six things that god despises or something like that one of them was like a proud proud mouth or like a proud lips mm -hmm. or something like that it's just like i'm sure christians have felt those across the centuries but it's like it just seems so applicable right now it just seems like so like I'm like, you know, oh, just give us a little bit longer, just a little bit longer, because I know it's bad. So, well, this is the it's it's kind of the reverse what you're describing. I mean, I think it's so it's so poignant, poignant what you've said there about and I've experienced it myself, like what you've said there about. And I'm saying not other people. I've experienced it in myself, I should say. Right. At, at various times is that it's like that is the common thing that somebody's like, well, you know, you're trading one addiction for another. And I think that one of those is like, if there's a materialist approach to it, it's very easy to do that. Um, but it's also like, it's kind of the, what you said about the, okay, I'm not drinking, but I'm smoking weed as like managing the thing. And then you coming to that realization is kind of, in some ways, it's like the reverse of the monastic saints where they'll be like, oh yeah, by the time uh, she passed away, she would wear a hair shirt. And then she added on chains <laughs> and then she yeah. added on this. And it's because eventually she could stand the hair shirt. Mm -hmm. Eventually she, it wasn't just, it, there was no discomfort with the hair shirt anymore. And so it's like, well, I guess I need some chains now. And then eventually yeah. they could stand the chains. And so yeah. then it was like, well, I guess I don't sleep anymore. It's like, yeah. and so it, it's interesting that it's the reverse of that, but yet the world has gotten so good that it's like, oh, not this anymore. I've got this other thing for you. Yeah. Oh, not that anymore. I've got this other thing for you. So if you think that it's the drinking, if you think that it's the drinking and not the sickness that is preventing you from taking, that's keeping you lukewarm yeah, and preventing you from being hot and cold, then you've, then you've missed it. You're just as the second that you get off, you come back on, which kind of brings us back to the idea of the priming, right? That it's almost like it's all a priming. Yeah. I it's mean, all a priming. This I promise I'll be done. But this is the problem. That I this is the this is the perspective I take with a lot of people I work with, is when when the when the forces when the powers that be are looking at addiction right now, they look at it purely through a physical materialist perspective. And I've talked on this before, and I won't belabor the point. The point what I what I say is, a lot of times when you are looking at counselors and people who are looking at what addiction is, they'll say, yeah, it's like someone's looking at a car. Like, this is the exhaust manifold. This is the battery. These are the headlights. This is the tire. This is what makes things go. This is how the car drives. I'll make sure. But there's this thing called gasoline. And it needs to go in there. Otherwise, none of the stuff. No, 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 no. We're not worried about gasoline. Gasoline's not been proven. We, this is the car. This is the car. And we're looking at the car. And this is it. And this is. So we have a flat tire. So we need to fix the flat tire. And then the car should be able to go. I'm like, yeah, but it needs gasoline. It's like, well, no, it doesn't need gasoline because the tire's flat. Once we fix the tire, things will get better. So it's like, okay, that's how come things like medically assisted treatment are so popular right now. Yeah, the person's not banging heroin anymore. They're still taking, you know, government heroin for all the people who are on medically assisted treatment. I'm the person that just sat here and said it. I'm on ADHD medication. So, you know, before you think I'm on some high horse, I'm not. I will say that at a certain point, there is the 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 cold hard having to just sink on the ground and just be like I don't got this I I have I don't I don't have this this is not something I can manage anymore like truly like even if I'm sober there's countless stories of people a decade in the sobriety and finally having that experience of being like this whole thing is just completely out of my hands I can't handle this like this giant black bean inside my head is the thing that it's it's the thing I cannot handle anymore. And it's almost like they've had the experience like, well, I thought you'd never ask for help. Like, I, I thought you'd never. And then that's when the help comes. Like, that's when, like, when I cannot stand it any longer. That's when it comes. And that experience, like I said before, with the glimpsing truth, 
they don't want you to have that. They don't want you to have, if you can get, if you can do marijuana management and everything's still the same and everything's fine and like your physical circumstances are getting better, that is what how we gauge. That's by you gauging. And, you know, we gauge your recovery by these physical circumstances changing. Well, sure, but you, you, the powers and principalities that be are not even allowing that person who has a very, very large chance to be able to encounter truly their own powerlessness over this thing and encounter Christ. We can't even let them have that because if they have that, then they could catch a glimpse of the truth. And once they catch a glimpse of the truth, they might get that thing where they're like a fox, like fathers talked about before they caught the scent. Like I'm going to keep chasing that scent. And so. And I would, I just want to add this little portion about asceticism, which is also um, with asceticism, with, if you're practicing asceticism correctly, that's what it does. So there's people who they'll go like, yeah, they'll hear what I said about there's no more fact about asceticism. We've talked about this before, but they go about the wrong way thinking that they're going to earn their way to God and to theosis through, you know, fasting and prostrations. And it's not true. Um, asceticism properly experienced is this process of asking for help. If you properly understand it. And it, it's what, it's what brings the real grace. The real grace is in you showing how tough you are. The real grace is being brought to a place of no endurance and then being able to cry out. That's what it does. Purposely making yourself weak, kind of. Like, like getting yourself to the point where you are willing to ask for help. Yeah, it's, it's priming yourself in such a way that you're, that the true state of your soul is, is reached. That's why building a family is, that's why it's either be, go be a father mm -hmm. or go be a monk. Like, but because the bottom line is, what's that father? There's nothing more ascetical than being a mother. Man. This is, and, and it's like, and you have no choice. It's like, I don't care who you are. If you're real about it and you're going to be a parent, mm -hmm. you're not prepared. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your education is. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care about any of those things, right? And as a matter of fact, all of those things might actually end up making you, might end up being stumbling blocks because you're like, if you have money, you might be like, oh, I can't handle this. So I'll just get a nanny. Well, you've done even worse now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now you've screwed it up because you've abdicated your responsibility, and that's going to have long-term effects on your relationship with your child that you're going to have to go and ameliorate later on. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like that's you're rude. almost better off being poor, like, you know, hungry, not starving, mm -hmm. right? But you're better off living with under modest means with enough to know that you don't know everything, you're not hyper-educated, right? Maybe that you haven't had all of these experiences and you don't have a lot of status. So it's easy for you to humble your easier for you to humble yourself. You know what I mean? Maybe that's a better place for you to be <laughs> an easier place for you to be that uh, otherwise you might be sick with, with, with room for nuance about the nanny thing. I was going to say, cause like, of course, I mean, of course, no, no, no. Uh, I'm the, the nuance, the nuance in the situation is I'm doing this because I have money. Right. Yeah. That and like I'm going to abdicate I, like and, and look, I'm talking about I'm talking about people that I know to where they're just like, ah, I don't care. I'll, I'll have kids uh, because and then I won't e I don't even need to take care of them. I'll just continue doing what I'm sure. doing. Sure. Like that. That's uh, that's what I'm saying about like, sure. no, no, no. Having having some help. I mean, look, when when I had my second daughter, we moved right back. We moved yeah. right back to my hometown. <laughs> okay. Sure. It was like, yeah. we're going right back to the hometown where I've got yeah. my, my stepsisters. I've got my mother. I've got yeah. my nieces. I've got my aunties. I've got everybody there. And we're going back there now. Say, <laughs> you know I, I mean? My mother-in-law is essentially a free nanny. So I that's mean, it. like, it's that's like, it. And she's fantastic. So I, but I think that that's, but I think there's also a piece there, right? Because I mean, even look at that inclination. Like it's, it's the inclination toward, well, I can't do it. 
Like, we can't do this. Like, we're at the edge of our endurance, so we need help. And then when you're living in that, then the value of family becomes evident. Man. Like, no one could ever tell you that, oh, you don't need to be near your family, or, oh, you don't need to have a relationship with family, or, oh, family's not important, or, oh, you, you know, they're not following whatever doctrine, so just ditch them. You'd be like, no, nah, I can't do that. No. And I think that that in and of it's just well, that, John that driving talks, yourself there. Yeah. St. John Chrysostom talks about that. He talks about like the ditching of a family just because they're not embracing Christ or whatever. And I, you know, and you know, you know why I know what you're saying is true is because I was just talking with someone the other day about how uh, we just had our fourth child, um, our fourth little, our, our second little boy, but our, our, our fourth kid. And um, uh I was talking to someone who's only just had his first and I said, zero to one is harder than three to four. Zero to one is like, because you are suddenly finding all the ways in which you're having to die to yourself. And it's completely new territory to die to yourself in that way. And it's like, I remember our zero to one was extremely difficult, but you know, three to four now is like, a, it's not easy, but it's like a military in here. It's like, all right, line up everyone. Like, you know, get your breakfast. Here's that, that, that. There's three things of oatmeal. There's three milks, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. All right, everyone get dressed. But like, it's because we've grown to like, I'll, I'll wake up every morning and be like, oh, I know I'm not going to get what I want today. Like, I know I'm not going to get what I want. And so, you know, but I've been talking a lot. So I'm going to try and we've got like five minutes left. Anything you want to say, Father? Blessed Lent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Indeed. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so what, what do I do here? Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, so we, if you want to contact us with contact at royalpath.network, that is our general contact. Now, someone just Con most people contact me still sometimes at andrew at royalpath.network you're free to do that um but the more timely response is probably going to come from the contact at royalpath.network that being said it's an assistant who's doing it for free please be merciful it's for a little while she has her own life you know you know she it takes her time to get back to stuff so don't don't worry too much about it if it's been a little bit um also thank you jack your thumbnails continue to be out of this world um literally um, they are pretty fantastic. Uh, we are uh, extremely happy with that. Um, there is a person, Cyprian. Can you talk about Skola Coffee for just one second? Um, just so or I maybe can... Father could do it because it's it's yeah. Mount Tabor, right? It's Mount Tabor School. It's the coffee. Father, did you want to? Yeah, and it's a wonderful, it's wonderful coffee, um, and also part of the blending or the roasting of the coffee. Um, the kids are involved with that, and um, it's actually pretty good coffee. <laughs> that's that's a big part of it. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, the proceeds go to help out uh, the school, so I think there'll probably be a link. But if you can get some school of coffee and um, enjoy the coffee, and also you know help out uh, Orthodox school while you're at it. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, it actually is pleasantly good because it's like, boy, it would have been tough if it weren't. <laughs> been like, oh man, yeah, guys, buy this coffee, but we were like, it's not very good. But it actually, like, luckily, it is actually pretty good. Um, so uh, there was a listener who I've been keeping up with, and he recently released from what I from what I understand a pretty decent song on youtube and i'm going to plug him because he asked gently and very respectfully hey would you mind just mentioning this and yeah i listened to the song and i was like i like this i like this it's um I'll, i've sent the link to our chat but if you could include it in the link cyprian or in the description that'd be great for the people who are curious it's hopefully holy fools and then he has a song that's the name of the artist and then it's uh boys in the womb or life after birth um it's it's really good. It's basically a conversation between um set to music between two babies in the womb. We're basically talking about like one of them's like, oh, the mother doesn't exist. And the other one's like, the mother exists. The mother's all around us. And he's like, no, 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 I don't believe in any of that stuff. And like it's actually a really, really well done song about that. So everyone, please check it out. Um, it's on uh the link I put was on YouTube. 
but yeah, it was it was legit. Um, and super can I just say that sounds like it would be a really good play, like a David Mamet style, just two guys sitting in normal clothes, or maybe like could be two women, whatever, and they're just sitting next to each other on chairs, like a play in three acts, but they're just babies in the womb talking to each other. Anyway, oh, I just had to say that. It just popped into my head that it, that would be an incredible play, I think. Could be really free, deep. Right? You gave that one for free? Yeah, that was for free. That was for free. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll work out the litigation later. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, it's 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 legit. Um, please check it out and show the guy some love. He's a really nice guy. Um, so uh, then beyond that, we have a merch store, royalpath.store. Um, any of that merchandise that gets sold, we don't see any of that money goes to the people who create it or to the parish. Um, then, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything, I don't remember what else we usually talk. Oh, there's the playlist. If we mention music, we try and stick it on a, uh, playlist on Spotify and Apple music called Royal Path podcast podcast playlist or something like that. You'll find it. Um, and other than that, I think that's it. I know. Oh, I've forgot to mention this remember i'm sure you guys aren't worried about it i'm sure nobody's really that worried about it but it is lent irregular posting schedule just saying it's gonna it's gonna be when we can be um father's still very busy um so uh you know in you know various services and such irregular posting schedule so i just thought i'd mention that but thank you very much for and thank you for having a good night bye-bye bye-bye and then